I, I have to ask you because it just ended. I have a feeling you've been watching The Last Dance and the Michael Jordan documentary. Have you been checking in on that? I have. And I love it, man. I love, I thought one of the last ones that resonated most to me was, you know, as, a, as an athlete, you, you want to be a great teammate and you, but ultimately you want to win. And sometimes, right, you, you, some of the guys are, are motivated differently, right? So some guys you yell at, some guys you're intense with, you're not so nice to. Well, all the guys, you got to learn how to be nice and learn how to motivate them. And I love Michael, man. He's like, I never, I, I never tried to be a good teammate. I just wanted to win. <laughs> Yeah, just just absolutely ruthless, trying trying to uh, will his team and drag everyone with him, and it's it's fitting to talk about that. This this week's theme is about competition and how to compete. You had such a long career in the pool. I want to start back at the beginning because I think people think about you and they think about you captaining teams and and just it it being a given. You're going to be on the team if there's going to be a national team. You're going to be there, but you had to make teams back in the day. When you're when you're 18 year old, when you're 18 years old, making that first national team, that first Olympic team, how'd you learn how to compete at a level that they wanted you to be part of that team? Well, at, you know, at a young age, obviously it was it was tough, right? You going from high school being a short kid, um, and then trying to every team building on it, going against the better players. But I think one of the most important things to me was in, in Monty Niskowski, right? One of the greatest coaches in American history. He pulls me, he pulls me aside after I had a horrible world championships or FINA cup in Australia. And he says, stop worrying about scoring. Stop worrying about what people think of you, you know, of, of how you're going to play and focus on yourself. Like we had an amazing center, Chris Humbert. And he's like, you, you, you give him the best passes, right? You earn four ejections a game, Tony, these are things that are so much more valuable to the team. So stop worrying and going in thinking, I hope I score three goals. And if I miss two, I'm going to be done. And that changed my life. And that, that moment, Greg, I went into every great game the same. I'd visualize defense. I'd visualize myself in the lane, countering as hard as I could. And I wanted every single person to guard me to remember me and to think that was the toughest player I ever played against in my entire life. And those are the memories that I wanted. And I knew I'd give everything in every single game and everyone would remember playing me. And then the next time they'd have nightmares. That was just, that was my, that was my mindset, right? I wanted to be remembered. And if I focused on the things that I could focus on, on countering, on swimming fast, on, on, on you know, playing amazing defense, the goals, they come, they come naturally, you know, shooting comes naturally. You bring up some great points there about doing other things. You don't necessarily have to be focused on scoring the goals. Not to, not to think back too much to this Bulls series, but I was struck by something that Steve Kerr said in that series about so badly wanting to let the better players like Jordan know he'd be ready. And for you as a younger player, you have a great player like Chris Humbert, you have veteran guys. Are you saying things to them? Is it just about your attitude and effort? How are they knowing that when they need to count on you, you're going to come through even though you're 18, 20 years old? Because of practice. The bottom line, I mean, I, I remember when games came, I was so excited. It was like a breath of fresh air. I'd wake up, I'd have my espresso, I'd read my newspaper. Ugh, all I had to do was play a game. Practice was brutal. I had to push every single button in practice because then you knew who were the ones that, that you wanted in the pool in the last minute, who were the ones that were going to choke in a big moment, who were the ones that weren't going to choke. And also you understood how to motivate people. Right. And, and every team was different. I mean, as a young kid, obviously, I'm not I'm not, you know, my first Olympics sitting there motivating people. But by the end, I could take a Peter Hudnut, look him straight in the eye and tell him to wake up. <laughs> and, he, and, and he and he looks right at me and then he just destroys the center while other guys. Right. And, and Adam or, or maybe a Peter Varalas, we, we had to speak differently with him. Right. Like that I was motivated in a different way. And the only way you figure that out is in the heat of the moment in practice, right? Games, all of these situations, they come naturally when you're pushing yourself in practice every day. We're talking with Tony Azevedo, five-time Olympian. You'd go on to play your college water pool at Stanford. So many kids that follow your 6'8 sports that follow us here desperately want to be part of a college team. You know college water polo, every year there's a new recruiting class. Every year someone is trying to come on and prove that they belong. You go to Stanford as a heralded player. How do you continue to make sure that you keep your spot? You know, so once you've earned it, once you've showed that you have this reputation for being a person that trains hard, 
and outworks everybody. How do you keep that competitive fire going so that someone doesn't come from behind and take your place? Well, I mean, I think, and this is for, you know, teams who have, who have won. And, and the same question is, you know, how do you keep up all, now you're the underdog, all the teams, or now you're, you're the target. All the teams want to beat you. They're going to come play their best game against you. And that's exactly what I wanted, man. I never wanted to be the underdog. I want, I wanted to be the, the, the top dog. I wanted every single team I played for that ever, I was going to get the best of everyone and I was going to beat them, right? That's like, that's what you strive for as an athlete. And so if you're a player on the national team, you shouldn't be happy that you made the national team. You should try to be the best player you can possibly be and push yourself every day because you have no idea what your limit is, right? What your ceiling is. And that's what I've always believed. And, and when you do that every day in practice and I see people – Maybe they aren't as talented or haven't played as long as some of the other athletes, but they are so passionate. They work so hard. They turn out to be the best teammates, right? There's the thing about water polo is you're not winning with one great player. You're not winning with two, three great players. You need a team. And, and going back to our team in 2008 for the Olympics, or even on some of my Stanford teams, right? Like the fact that Peter Hudnut was our third guard and played, three quarters in the gold medal game and kept the center at or in the semi and gold medal game and kept the center at three meters. That's impressive. That's a guy that no one in the, who has, you know, doesn't get all the accolades, but we don't win a medal with, if he's not on our team and doesn't do what he does. And so it's those little things that an athlete does every day that gets the respect of the coaches, the players. And again, you want to be remembered the right way. And none of us wake up and go ahead and ask Phelps and go ahead and ask, you know, why go when he comes on the, tomorrow if all any of us woke up at five in the morning and enjoyed uh, training? <laughs> you don't. You don't wake up and go, yay, I'm going to go swim for an hour. <laughs> you wake up, you wake up, you show up to the pool and you go, all right, it's my time to get better. Right. Why would you do anything not all out? And that's that's always been my my question, my my theory. You had the good fortune, as you mentioned, you're on these Stanford teams that were great, that won titles, your high school teams were strong. You win, you win an Olympic silver medal, but you had those years with Team USA where, where it didn't go well, right? Where the team was not performing to where you want to perform. A lot of water polo players have this experience. They love the sport. They show up every day. It just doesn't come. The wins don't happen. How do you know that what you're doing is still the right thing? How do you stay confident in the effort you're putting out when you're not getting the results you always want? Yeah, well, you know, it, it took – you know, as a young kid going on that 2000 team, I mean, we used to beat everyone. Chris Oding now, who's the assistant on the women's team, Gavin Arroyo, who's the assistant on the men's team, um, Shai Cradell, Chris Humbert. I mean, these guys are known around the world and they were playing on the top clubs. And, and we knew going into 2000, it was devastating because we had beaten everyone. There's not a team that we didn't beat. Then going to the next, to, to 2004, right? Uh, you know, we, we knew that we needed something different. And that's when we started with Racco training harder, harder than everyone else. I knew individually that some of us were on the right path because we were playing on some of the top teams in Europe. So individually we were considered some of the best, but what we didn't have is we didn't come together as a team. And our last, that before 08, we all came together. We lived, all of us, except for JW Krumpholz, lived in Europe, played a year, came together. And it was the little things that, Coach Terry Schroeder used to tell me about, look, give up a little bit of yourself for the better of the team, meaning if we're playing Brazil, or uh, not, that's a bad example, but we're, if we're playing any game and we're up by a, a little bit, let's make sure we give uh, some of these athletes, some of these players the opportunity to score instead of you scoring, and that's going to give them confidence. And these were little things, and the same in practice and taking the time to go get a coffee and, and talk about life with some of these guys that we really created this bond. And even now we have a weekly 2008 Beijing brews where we have beers and talk about the past. So it, it's, <laughs> it's, it, it, it really, it really comes down. And I think athletically, even on our side, our men's side, athletically, we can match anyone. It's just all of everyone has to come together and create a culture, uh, a winning culture and a culture of mutual. You don't have to love everyone, but in the water you have to respect and believe in everyone. The women have created it, and that's what we need on the men's. Talking with Tony Azevedo here, you mentioned the Beijing team. It's, it's such a memorable moment for that U.S. team. For those that don't remember it, 
They essentially go from worst to very close to first, ninth in the in the world to a podium finish, a silver medal in Beijing. You had mentioned the work that you were putting in leading up. You're your, your working hard in practice. You're, you're leaving your mark on the game. Everyone else is getting better individually. And then finally the team comes together. For those that haven't experienced it, whether it's the Olympics or even their, their, their club team, whatever it is, what does that look and feel like to you when everybody is bought in, everyone is competing the way that you know you've been competing? It, it, it's given me goosebumps today, you know, like, I mean, I always tell coaches, perfect defense. It's just whatever you do, if you're all on the same page, it's going to work. Right. And so we really, all of us believed in that. And when we came to video, there was no shying away from certain players. I would get ripped just as much as everyone. And I would take it. And if I took it, then everyone else is going to take it. And Ryan, took it and Adam Wright took it and everyone started realizing, Hey, we're in this to get better. No one's sitting here saying, I want to be the leading scorer. I want to be the star. We are going to shock the world. And I think having, I mean, we were 11th, I think going in ninth and then 11th before uh, going into that Olympics. And yeah, we shocked the world and playing Serbia is one of the greatest feelings ever. That's the only team we hadn't beaten mind you since they separated from Yugoslavia. So we had never beaten Serbia and they basically lost on purpose to play us and then we go and absolutely destroy them. It was one of the greatest experiences uh, <laughs> you know getting to that gold medal game. We're talking with Tony Azevedo here from Team USA five-time Olympian. If you have any questions for Tony we'll, we'll uh, sneak a few of them in at the end. Feel free to leave them in the comments. You and Maggie have teamed up 6-8 sports. You have you have the hat on now and, and we've seen all the all the stuff you've been sharing as you've gotten deep into this and, and you've always done camps and clinics, that sort of thing, but as you've really launched this, this kind of movement and app with six, eight, when it comes to the competitive side of things, what, what are the main messages you're trying to get across to people that you talk to, to the zoom chats you lead to the app videos you share? We know there's a lot of technique and tactical stuff, but the mental side of it, what are you drilling into people's heads these days? Communicate. Stop living in this world that water polo is a secret or that my club and that club, you know, shouldn't be, you know, I, we're, we're, we're rivals. It's like, no, we are a sport. We're the, a beautiful, the toughest sport in the world. And we all have to come together more as a community. And that's what I see. I go around and do these camps and I see these mini rivalries between everyone in the sport. And it makes no sense. The bigger the sport, the bigger it is for everybody, right? If the, the bigger the sport, the more you get to be in more of a professional setting to calling games <laughs> every game, yeah. right, instead of just a couple games. And I think that's the, the biggest thing. Like, I go around, and, and the measurables are huge because we need to understand where our athletes are, right, when we do the 6A challenge. And we have the technical side of it that coaches hopefully can watch, and then now we're bringing in all the analytics, and then, um, and I think that's just going to take the game into the right direction. But I don't know if you saw, we, we're launching in a week the virtual reality uh, goggles. Nice. So we got those, and you'll basically be running through some uh, myself and Maggie talking about six on five and what your eyes should be looking at. I think that's really important. And we're just trying to evolve. You know, this is, this is a time where my pri pr predominant way was to, to camps to make a living, you know, until six, eight becomes a profitable and now it's just like all right now we're going to help coaches and we're going to reach out to kids and now we're going to come out with virtual reality now we're going to come out with our first six eight elite academy starting in september where you know kids will train with myself and uh and my dad for for you know nine months so we're just trying to we're just trying to keep thinking because we need uh, you know manuel Estiardi said water pole you know will never die but my i think yes it won't die but well, we're really hanging on here, right? You know, we're, 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 we're not really living. Let's live, right? Let's get together and let's blow this sport up. And all of us are going to look back and say, hey, this was a time that we changed it around and we became one of the greatest sports in modern day history. It's so great to hear you say that stuff. And it's, it's something that uh, always fires me up. And, I, and I've been complaining about it for years. But this idea of people devaluing the water polo experience in different areas, you know, just because you play the game in state X, for example, we have a commenter from Illinois, you know, so 
someone in California might say, well, just because you played in Illinois, it's not, it's not the same, you know, California is more important. And Illinois might say, well, that about Ohio and Texas might say it about this sport or, or about this state. And to your point, it's, it's not big enough for anyone to be drawing lines in the sand about who's doing it better than someone else. Yeah, you're right. And the other thing is, 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 is this that I'll put back on some of the clubs, you know, we, we play so many games and honestly, I think we play too many. So instead of going to another tournament where you're going to win a, you know, a mindless little, little, little uh, trophy, why don't you go, go back East from, if you're a California team, go, go to Texas, go to, go to Chicago, because you're going to help so much by you or one other club going out there, you're going to make a stand and you're going to make, you're going to make a moment for them that could help change and maybe have more Olympians coming out of, coming out of those States. Because what I, what I see when I travel, the talents there and the passion is there too. They just don't get as many opportunities as we do here. So who can help? They can help, right? Clubs here can help. Let's go and, and create a, create, Hey, every, we're going to go and, hang out in, uh, in, in Dallas, Texas for two days, us two clubs, and have a nice tournament, right? And you're doing something for the sport. Now you're saving the sport. And you've seen it in, back to your playing days or even now when you're going to camp or clinic. Not that there isn't love for what you do in California. When you go Midwest, you go East Coast, the reaction is on another level. It's rock star level. Yeah. That game in Chicago is still my favorite game <laughs> I've yes. ever played in. I mean, packed house, short, short, uh, shallow pool, just yep. bloody as could be. But it was just, I mean, that fans, I loved it. And, and, and even when we went to Houston for, for the year before my last Olympics or 2016, yep. unbelievable. Unbel and we, I, we, we should definitely be doing that more. We were going to have it in Indianapolis. They did a great job. You guys did a great job. Of course, we had to cancel that. But, like, it, it, we're in the step in the right direction, but I would put it on some of the clubs and coaches down here. You know, may, it, maybe it's just a vacation, but that little vacation is doing something for the sport. A couple of questions here. Now we're talking with Tony Azevedo, just a random grab bag here. Tony, the questions that have come in. What do you think about Philippe Filipovich? Where does he rank among the all-time greats for you? You know, Philip's a great player, man. I mean, he's, he is just one of the more dynamic shooters uh, just tough player. I remember when he was just a little, little guy just starting out and, and to where he's gotten today. Uh, he's definitely going to go down in time in history as one of the greatest left-handers ever to play. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I think, I think uh, his mark finally on winning that gold medal is put him, he'll, he'll go down in history. My favorite left-hander ever was Tibor Benedict. He was to me the hardest player to ever play against um as uh, on the lefty side and what a defender what a competitor fast posting up he did whatever it took for the team and i can even remember in 2008 when they beat us he didn't score i think like one goal or maybe it was yeah one goal like the whole first four games and all of a sudden he just comes out when it's needed like that that's to me a leader and that that was the hardest guy i played that against next question and, and we get this one all the time so it's good to rehash it but Matt asks, what will it take to get a pro league in the United States? That's, I mean, look, that's exactly where my head's at, right? And when I first retired, that was the first thing I wanted to do. But, but what it will take is the analytics, right? And that's something that I know all of us have talked about. And I think now with our iPad, with all the game analytics that are going to store on a, on, a, you know, on a site and store on the iPad, now we can collect stats from every player everywhere all the time. Around the world, we have partners in Australia, South Africa. That's what's going to take to get a professional league. Because I, the reality is I don't have time to watch every Laker game. But I go on ESPN.com. I click. I see the box score. Right? I see the live stats on my Twitter. These are all things that are huge. Like, they don't know how many games I played in my career, how many minutes I played, how many earned ejections. That's unacceptable. Yeah. Right? You, you need to know that. We need to know Maggie Steffens and Kylie Neuschel. And, 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 and Ben Halleck. We didn't know all, all the things that they did when they were 10 years old, not because it was, it's important for stats as a 10-year-old, but it's important for the future. So we can go back and say Tony could hold the med ball at 10 years old this long, and then he made a big jump from 14 to 16. But, you know, all of a sudden you have this comparison. We don't have anything like that. So that's why we've started very slowly, and now we've gotten pretty much everything. And trust me, that's where my head's at right now. 
couple other questions here. Uh, Bennett asks, Tony, what would be the best approach to bring a team together to play as a team rather than a bunch of individuals on a team? Uh, you know, I think, I think that's, that's, the, that's the leaders in the water, right? Pulling players aside, talking as a team. One of the things we used to do is we used to all go to coffee and it became like this mandatory thing after practice. We'd all go to coffee and, or we'd have a beer together when you were older and, and, and just try to sit there and, and, and figure out how everyone clicks. Because, yes, there's individual, individualists in, in our sport, all right? All, there's tons and guys with crazy egos. But a lot of us just sit there and say, oh, he just doesn't care about anything else but himself. Well, no, I would put it back on you and say, how much have you invested in understanding what makes that guy click? Because everyone has something that motivates and something that makes him click. And when you figure that out, you're going to find a better way to, to get him on the side of, hey, look, that was a great goal, but I see in this situation, like, you know, maybe the next time you could pass to me and then he looks, oh, yeah, okay, he's on my side. Next thing you know, you got yourself a team. So I think having team conversations, having team bonding things and really try and understand all the players' personalities. That's, that's one of the greatest things that water polo gave me was – I, I, you know, is understanding what makes a player cl click, understanding in a clinic what makes a, what makes a kid, you know, click. And I can see it in their eyes if it's not working. And there's plenty of ways to motivate them. We're talking to Tony Azevedo. A couple more here before we let him go. Skip Water Polo asks, uh, how do you deal with the learning plateau? So I guess maybe feeling like, you know, there's, there, there's not much else for you to learn and kind of diminishing returns on that. Does that affect your motivation? No, I mean, the learning plateau, there's no learning plateau, man. I, I mean, I, I, learned, I learned things in my last Olympics, right? I, I remember Dayon was trying to teach us to defend a certain way, and it was just really tough for me to do it, right? You could, can, can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I figured out a new way how to guard, and all of a sudden, it, it was some of the best defense that I've been doing my entire life, and I've been known for defense. So, like, there's never a point where you stop that learning plateau. There's always more and more and more to learn right i mean even now doing these camps i'm learning from the kids man i'm learning i'm learning uh to, to teach how to egg beat which is really hard <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know i'm learning like you know w what areas that i go out to where what what needs that they 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 need and how and how i can better help them right there's always the moment you stop learning to step away from the sport Alex asks, how do we get more minorities into the sport? Mentions Ashley Johnson has been amazing. Fellow Long Beach native Max Irving now with the men's senior team. I imagine everywhere you're going and trying to bring water polo to every corner of the country is helping. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think splash ball was a great, uh, a great start to getting it out in, in, in smaller venues. I'm thinking, you know, YMCAs. We just got to make water polo something that doesn't that, – that can be played pickup water polo, right? I created – uh, the other the other day uh, a two-on-two pickup water polo game and it's called stay in the lane you, you touch them it's a foul just like basketball and you can only use one hand and it's on land and all of a sudden you're learning you're staying in the game you're posting up just like that you can do that in the water right we gotta we gotta create more and be uh more opportunities for kids that are just in a backyard pool or at a pool a, you know a mass pool for for some camp to play with the ball because the reality is I don't care who you are. You'd much rather jump in a pool, throw a ball and a goal than jump in a pool, put goggles on and follow a black line. Last thing for you here, this whole pandemic coronavirus, it's left people out of the pool away from the sport they love. We've all had time to reflect. You are as passionate about water polo now as when you were 16 years old. Why are you still so excited about this sport? You know, when I, when I, uh, when I retired, it was, it was one of those moments. I was like, look, I, I, I need to figure out what I want to do. And I remember some, like Schumacher told me to go into insurance. <laughs> a lot of people that, you know, gave me decent offers to do stuff. And, and when I sat down, you know, I talked to my wife and I was like, look, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to be a coach right now because a coach is worried about their team. I want to worry about the sport itself. And I, I needed time to go around the country and see what we needed. And as I did that, I met some amazing people and I realized w w exactly what the sports need and the sport does need. So you can't have someone who's been around the sport for 20, you know, 
27 years, I mean, 20, 30 years, really. I started when I was eight. So 30 years and then just walk away. And I always wanted to do something I'm passionate about. And then the first time I heard Maggie sp speak, I was like, she needs to be my partner. And it's just been great. I mean, we talk once a week and she's just so passionate. It's just like I am. And it gets me even, like, I'm like a little kid when we get together. I'm like, yeah, Maggie, and then we can do this and then let's do this. And then our, our, our tech team's like, calm down, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, uh, always, always going to catch up with you. Looking forward to seeing you back uh, at the pool very soon once all this stuff clears up. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Greg. You as well. All right. Take, take care, care everybody. everybody. Peace.